Hello everyone, welcome back to my class. Today we will learn about uses the applications of uh, fiber repair interferometer. In the last class, uh, we were introduced with fiber repair interferometer and uh, etalon. We also understood the difference between the interferometer and the etalon. Today we will uh, learn about its applications. Yeah. Application of fiber repair is predominantly in spectroscopy. The fiber repair interferometer is frequently used to examine the detailed structure of a spectral lines. A hypothetical purely monochromatic light wave, yeah? just observe this word hypothetical because uh, it is impossible to have a purely monochromatic light source. Yeah? The hypothetical purely monochromatic light wave generates a particular circular fringe system. Yeah? We already studied in the last class that this is the type of the fringe pattern we observe in fiber repair interferometer provided we have only one wavelength. But if we have more than one, then each for each wavelength we will observe such, such type of fringe pattern and then uh, the screen it would be quite complicated looking. Yeah? We, and we know that the phase difference is a function of wavelength, yeah? the, the, the wavelength appear in the expression of phase different. So that if the sources, if the source were made up of two such monochromatic components, two superimposed ring system would result. Yeah? because we have two wavelength, one wavelength will make this type of ring pattern, the other which is wavelength which is adjacent to the first, it will also make its own ring pattern and they were, would be very closely sitting if the wavelengths are very close. Okay? Now using this spectroscopic tool, this fiber repair spectrometer or fiber repair interferometer, we can investigate the separation between the two wavelength, the values of these wavelength and the resolving power of uh, the spectrometer. Now, when the individual fringes partially overlap, a certain amount of ambiguity exists in deciding when the two systems are individually discernible, that is when they are set to be resolved. Okay? The statement says that suppose we have two ring patterns which are say this far. Now, if the wavelength which generated uh, these two fringe patterns, if it is very closely spaced, then the fringes would also be very close, these rings would also be very close, the center of these rings will come very close to the other. And in this situation, probably we will not be observed or we will not be able to trace the width of uh, the fringes or the peak of the fringes, because in this situation, the peaks which we studied in our last class, they would be sitting very close to each other and it would be so close that probably we mistakenly say that they are one peak, but they are two in reality. Yeah? Therefore, a proper definition is required when the two peaks would be called resolvable. Okay? And the definition came from Lord Rayleigh. He gave a criteria which is called Lord Rayleigh criteria. According to Lord Rayleigh's criterion, the fringes are just resolvable when the combined irradiance of both fringes at the center or saddle point of the resultant broad fringe is 8 by pi square times the maximum irradiance. Okay? Then the Rayleigh says that the fringes are just resolvable, just resolvable means if they are a bit more close, then we would not be able to resolve or the interferometer would not be able to resolve them and the, it may read them as one. But if they are placed in such a way that the irradiance at the center of the two peaks is equal to one, the maximum intensity by 8 pi square, then they would be said to be just resolved. Okay? Now, this is uh, this can easily be understood through this figure. In this figure, we have two peaks which are from two wavelengths. Yeah, suppose this is from wavelength lambda one, and this is from wavelength lambda two, and these two peaks are very close because the corresponding wavelengths are very close. Now, if you plot delta and the relative uh, irradiance, then you see that the two peaks are sitting very close to each other 
and we know that if we have two sources which are totally incoherent then the resultant irradiance distribution at the screen would be sum of the two intensities or sum of the two irradiance. Therefore, the total irradiance in this case would be the sum of the two irradiance ir irradiances and therefore, roughly we will see something like this. Okay. This envelope is sum of the two irradiances, the first irradiance plus second irradiance. Okay. And here we see there is a saddle point at the center we have a saddle point. Okay. And this is what exactly is being shown here also. Okay. And this is your first peak, first maxima which correspond to the first wavelength and this is second maxima which correspond to the other wavelength, the second one. And if you sum these two irradiances then you get this the dashed one, the dashed line. yeah. And if you sum these two irradiances, then you see that at the center you get a saddle point. Okay. And Lord Rayleigh said that if the saddle point is 8 by pi square times the maximum, suppose here the maximum is 1 and is the saddle point is 8 by pi square, then the two peaks would be resolvable. We can say that they are resolvable and if they are closer then saddle point would be a bit up and then we cannot resolve them. If the saddle point is lower then they of course are resolvable. Okay. Now suppose that del A represents the phase value for first wavelength for which we get maximum. At this phase value the first wavelength gives us a maxima and at del B value of the phase, the second wavelength gives us maxima. Okay, there are two maxima and also assume that the separation between the these two are the, dist, uh, the difference between these two phases is delta del. Okay. The two maximas which owes their origin in two wavelengths, they are also supposed to have same ma maximum irradiances. Okay. Say their irradiances are I A and I B and they are here supposed to be equal. Okay. I A max is equal to I B max and the maxima of the two peaks fall on this line. Okay. Now, here what you see that there is another intensity irradiance point which is represented by I prime. I prime represents the irradiance of second peak or the irradiance value of the second wavelength. Okay. This is the irradiance peak of the first wavelength and at this phase value the irradiance of the second is given by I prime. Now, here since the peaks are symmetric, the, uh, they, they, they have same width and the same height or same irradiance. The I prime value for both the wavelength for both the irrad irradiances is same. Therefore, we can safely draw a horizontal line and these are the two values of the intensities of the other wave wavelength. Yeah. Now, one more thing you must keep into the mind is that the second peak will appear at a phase separation of 2 pi yeah because on each 2 pi we will get a maximum because del is equal to integral multiple of 2 pi this is the uh, one maximum this is the second successive maximum okay now consider the case in which the two constituent fringes have equal irradiances this we have already talked about the peak of the resultant occurring at del is equal to del a now we are talking about this value of phase. Now, the question is what would be the value of total irradiance at this del value? The total irradiance at del is equal to del A would be the irradiance due to the first peak and irradiance due to the second one, but second one is this one. Yeah, 
let let me let us choose a different color probably th this would increase the visibility this is the second peak okay and we see that the value of irradiance of the second peak at del is equal to del a is i prime yeah this we have already talked about therefore the total irradiance would be i a max which is this value and then plus i prime and this would be equal to 1 here yeah the total irradiance i at del a would be equal to i a max plus i prime. Now, we can write it safely yeah? i t max the total irradiance maximizes because at del is equal to del a we have peak of the, uh, the, the, the we have maxima yeah? the peak of irradiance. Therefore, we write i t max would be equal to i a max plus i prime. Okay. Similarly, at del is equal to del b, i t max would be i b max plus i prime, but since i a max is equal to i b max, we can use them alternatively. Okay. At the saddle point means at this dip, yeah, at this dip, the irradiance i 8 pi square into i t max is the sum of two constituent irradiances. Okay. Now, here you, you in the figure you see this is the saddle point and here we will have to add up the intensity of the red and the intensity of the blue or irradiance of the red and irradiance of the blue and therefore, this is the irradiance of the first peak and this is the irradiance of the second peak. Okay. Now, in this figure irradiance maximizes at del is equal to del A. Okay. This is del A where first irradiance is, irradiance is maximizing and here is the center, center is this one which is delta del by 2 away, yeah. delta del by 2 unit away from del A. Similarly, center from the second peak would be delta del by 2 unit away from delta b. Okay. Now, if you calculate the irradiances at the center for 2 peaks and add them up, then we will get the irradiance at the saddle point and this is what is being done here. We calculate irradiance of the first at a phase point of del a plus delta del by 2 and we calculate irradiance of the second peak at a phase point of del b plus delta del by 2. Now, I should have used here minus sign del, del b minus uh, delta del by 2, but this is plus sign is also correct, but because the irradiance value irrespective whether we are going in plus direction or minus direction it is same, because the this uh, peak is symmetric. Yeah. Now, the i prime by i a max would be equal to the uh, value of irradiance at del a plus delta del okay because this is i prime is is being calculated at the center at the at at the uh, center of the one of the peaks okay not center of the two peaks it's the center of the one of the peaks this is the second peak and its center is here the i make i prime is calculated here Similarly, for red color or the similarly for red peak, the i max is calculated here, i prime is calculated here okay? and this is the i prime value. Okay? And if you want to calculate i prime, the relative uh, irradiance i prime, then you calculate irradiance at del a plus delta del okay? and this will give you the relative irradiance value at the second peak. Okay, we have two peaks and we want to calculate this irradiance here at this peak. Similarly, this irradiance here at this peak. Okay, at the peak of other wavelength, what would be the value of irradiance of the first one? This is given by I prime and its relative value would be irradiance at del is equal to del A plus delta del. Okay. these are i primes which are same okay if the peaks are 
symmetric identical then uh, both i primes would be the same. Now, if we know this then we can solve now equation number 40 substitute for these two area functions and uh, then substitute the value of the phases and after a bit of calculation uh, we can get the expression of delta del and which for the large value of f which is coefficient of finesse would be equal to 4.2 by square root of f. Okay. What does this represent? This represents the smallest phase increment delta del min separating the two resolvable fringes. Why does this represent the smallest uh, phase increment? Because the because of equation 40. You see on the left hand side that this is i t max is the maximum intensity and then we are multiplying with 8 pi pi square which is the Rayleigh criteria, Rayleigh criteria for fringes that are just resolvable. Okay. For just resolvable fringes we have equation number 40 and it is giving the minimum delta del. Okay. If we solve equation number 40 we will get the value of delta del which is the least for the observable for the resolvable fringes and therefore, equation number 40 2 gives the minimum value of delta del. Okay. Now, we know from our uh, last lecture that the part difference is equal to 2 n f d cos theta and plus there was a term 2 phi okay, which was equation number 28. Then uh, we rewrite that equation and in this form and uh, m capital lambda is the integral multiple of wavelength which is again part difference phi is uh, it's 2 n f d cos theta is intact and this is the term. Okay, it is just rewritten equation number 22 is rewritten and now it is named as equation number 43. And now after writing equation number 28 we said that uh, that in, the, in the, there was a deno in the denominator there was wavelength and we said that the wavelength is very uh, small and d is large therefore, the second term is relatively very small and therefore, neglected and this we do here too. We will drop equation uh, the second term on right hand side of equation number 43 and then differentiate the rest of the term. Now, if you differentiate uh, equation number 43 after dropping this term then you will get m lambda naught is equal to 2 n f d cos theta t. Here n f is the refractive index of the film which is uh, in the cavity, d is the thickness of the cavity, theta is the angle. They all are constant quantity, they are fixed, they will not vary and therefore, their differenti differentiation would be 0. m is the order and lambda is the wavelength and since we are in using our uh, fabry perot as a spectroscopic tool, the wavelength may vary. Yeah? We may have several wavelength and we may have several orders too. Yeah? one order may coincide with like nth order of one wavelength may coincide with uh, mth order of uh, second wavelength and there are several other possibilities. Therefore, both lambda and m the order of the fringe uh, are variable here and therefore, we can after differentiation we can write this m into delta lambda naught plus lambda naught into delta m is equal to 0. Okay? Delta m is differentiation of m delta lambda is differentiation of the, uh, lambda naught. And from equation 44 we can write this lambda upon delta lambda is equal to minus m upon delta m. Okay. Now, minus sign does not hold any significance it, it, it just says that if one quantity is increasing the other is decreasing. Okay. Now, we also know then when phase changes by 2 pi the m which is an integer it changes by 1, 1 unit. Okay. Therefore, 2 pi by delta del would be equal to 1 by delta m this relation we can easily guess. Okay. Now, once we do know this relation then from here we can get the expression of delta m and from here delta m would be equal to delta del by 2 pi. Okay. And if we know this relation, then we will substitute this in this relation lambda naught by delta lambda naught is equal to m by 
delta m. We will substitute here for delta m and this substitution will give us equation which is lambda naught upon delta lambda naught is equal to 2 pi m upon delta del. Okay. The ratio of lambda naught to the least resolvable wavelength difference is known as chromatic resolving power italic r of any spectroscope. Okay. Now, here while doing so we picked here delta del which is least smallest for least uh, resolvable separation. Okay, the smallest resolvable separation. If delta lam, delta del is small, then we will have delta lambda naught minimum. Once delta lambda naught is minimum, then this relation lambda naught upon delta lambda naught minimum, this is defined as italic r, which is called chromatic resolving power. Okay and uh, chromatic resolving power defines the power of resolving the different wavelength of any uh, spectroscopic tool. Okay, here in our case it is Fabry Perot interferometer. Okay. Therefore, if we know the smallest value of delta del we can calculate the smallest value of delta uh, lambda naught and from there the resolving power the chromatic resolving power of the Fabry Perot interferometer. Okay. Now, for normal incidence we can use equation number 42 which is uh, nothing but this relation uh, no no this is uh, yeah 4.2 by square root of f and uh, the relation should be because here we are using lambda naught upon delta lambda naught which is 2 pi m by del and we know that uh, m lambda okay this is the relation yeah equation number 43 m lambda naught is equal to 2 nfd cos theta and okay m lambda naught is equal to 2 nfd cos theta for normal incidence this term would be 1 and m lambda naught is equal to 2 nfd or m is equal to 2 nfd by lambda naught okay we can replace for m and when you when, when, once you replace for m in this relation in relation 47 and then substitute for delta del then you get uh, this relation equation number 48 okay and from here you can also get uh, that resolving power is equal to finness into m m is the integer order of the fringe okay once you know this and are once you know what is the the re least resolvable wavelength separation then you can also calculate the corresponding least resolvable frequency separation because delta nu is related to delta lambda naught through this relation. Okay, therefore, minimum resolvable bandwidth would be given by equation number 49. Okay, here we just substituted for delta lambda. Okay, you can express delta lambda naught in terms of delta nu and once uh, you do this you can get the minimum value of delta nu the minimum resolvable bandwidth. Now, as the two components present in the source become increasingly different in wavelength or alternatively if we you keep varying the wavelength in such way in such a way that delta lambda naught increases slowly then the overlapping peaks separate okay initially the wavelengths were close then the peaks were like this and if you increase lambda the delta lambda then what will happen these peaks will be separated okay. and as the wavelength difference increases the mth order fringe from one wavelength will approach to the m plus 1th order film for the other wavelength. What it says is that suppose for one wavelength you were having such type of fringe pattern and if you increase the wavelength or if you change the wavelength then what ultimately will happen is that that suppose this is the uh, fringe pattern for the second wavelength yeah now if you keep increasing the wavelength separation then the two fringes which were initially very close they will open up they will start going away from each other and a situation may come when 
this fringe may start overlapping with the red one, the next one. Okay. The situation may come that the blue one falls on the red one if you keep varying the wavelength. Okay. And in this situation, the mth order fringe for one wavelength that is lambda naught will approach to the m plus 1th order of the other wavelength lambda naught minus delta lambda naught, okay, the smaller wavelength. Okay. The particular wavelength difference at which overlapping takes place that, uh, that is known as free spectral range and is designated by delta lambda naught FSR. Okay. It means if this is your fringe pattern of a particular wavelength and if you keep varying the delta lambda naught, then it may so happen that one wavelength may start overlapping with the second one and this overlapping happens for different orders. The mth order fringe of one wavelength may start to overlap with the m plus 1, 1th order fringe of the other wavelength. Okay. Now, initially and, and then if you keep varying then what will happen that it will slowly again separate and then it will start to overlap with the next one. Okay. Then the separation at which this overlap overlapping takes place is called delta lambda naught and this is known as free spectral wavelength and designated as delta lambda naught FSR. Okay. This is wavelength to wavelength separation, this is this is delta lambda FSR. Okay. Now, from equation number 47, this is our equation, a change in del of 2 pi correspond to delta FSR is equal to lambda naught by m. Okay. Okay, here the del is changed by 2 pi that lambda, delta lambda FSR you say if you substitute delta uh, this uh, del by 2 pi then delta lambda FSR would be lambda naught by m okay? and this is the expression for delta lambda FSR and this is true only for normal incidence okay? and therefore delta lambda FSR can be expressed by delta lambda sorry lambda naught square by 2 nfd because we know uh, that delta lambda fsr as given above is this and m lambda is equal to 2 nfd yeah in case of normal incidence therefore m would be 2 nfd by lambda and if you replace a uh, substitute for this m then you will get this relation and once delta lambda naught is known, the corresponding uh, spectral width can also be calculated and which is given by here. Delta nu FSR would be C by 2 NFD. And here what we see is that delta lambda FSR, it is inversely proportional to the thickness D, the width of the fabry pero cavity. Okay. But if you go back and check for the expression of delta lambda mean, then delta lambda mean is again inversely proportional to d. Okay, they both are inversely proportional to d. But what do we want? We want a instrument we can which can resolve the two peaks which are very closely spaced. Okay, therefore we want delta lambda mean to be as small as possible. Okay. We want delta lambda mean very small, we want, we want our instrument to have very high resolving power which means it can separate even very closely spaced wavelengths and alongside we also want that delta lambda FSR be very large because if we vary the wavelength the one of the fringes should not start, must not start overlapping with the another order of the other wavelength. Okay. Therefore, this peak to peak separation this delta lambda FSR we want this to be very huge. Okay. But how can we achieve it? Bec from this relation what we know is that if you, if you want to decrease delta lambda mean then we need to increase d yeah? and this can be written like this. 
if we increase d then what this will lead to delta lambda mean decrease okay and this is fav favorable for us we want this to happen okay if we want a smaller a smaller value of delta lambda naught we will have to increase d but let us see what would be the effect of increasing d in the delta lambda fsr and delta lambda fsr is given here and here too if you increase d then delta lambda fsr will reduce down it means the fringes in a spectral domain will come closer to each other okay but we don't want this yeah if they will be very close then there would be a possibility of overlap therefore we cannot randomly play with the d the width of fabry pair interferometer okay now if you take the ratio of delta lambda fs r upon delta lambda min then this is this is found to be equal to italic f which is thinness okay this is a constant okay then there is a trade off between the two okay and depending upon the requirement of a particular application we can play with the values so as the coefficient of thinness remains constant okay and this is all for this lecture and uh, thank you for listening me